Okay. Hello, everyone. Today, we're honored to be joined by Dr. Betsyba Demuth. Um, Dr. Demuth is an assistant professor at Brown University. And like truly, she is a multifaceted scholar renowned in environmental history, climate change, marine studies, indigenous Russian and US history. And amongst numerous publications, she published a book called Floating Coast that has received great praise. And a lot of our discussion is going to be centered around that book. So I recommend everyone to take a look at that work after this webinar. And if you can't find any resources, just reach out to me and I can share those along. Um, so so um, starting off with the, like looking to talk about wetlands. Um, and in one of your like publications, you talked about how like environments are viewed as biological supermarkets today. So um, can you just explain this idea of like, I guess how capitalism ties into environmental studies that you conduct? Great, and thank you so much uh, for the invitation, Emily. And this is really fun to be here and um, to virtually be with you all uh, the way we're all together anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a great question. One of the things that I'm interested in as an environmental historian are the ways in which societies choose to value um, things in the world around them. So valuing people and what people do and the kinds of work uh, that they provide for their communities, but also the ways in which we think about and value the natural systems that um, we live with and live within. Um, and so one of the things that I have um, started to think about in relationship to how capitalism does this is the ways in which we tend to, um, rather than see environments as places where the value comes because of the relationships between animals and plants and natural land landforms and people, um, but instead see the value as coming from individual pieces of a ecosystem that we can extract. So thinking about whales as being valuable because they can provide whale oil in the case of like the 19th century um, or thinking about oil as being valuable in the 20th century and the 21st century rather than thinking about whales as part of a larger ecosystem that uh, provides value to all sorts of different animal plant um, communities and also to human communities um, or oil as being an important piece of geology that perhaps should stay underground rather than being extracted. Um, so that's kind of what I mean when I think about um, this sort of tendency to take take connections and reduce them to their individual parts. Mm -hmm. And that like idea of reduction, I feel like a lot of like people, especially like students who might not be as like technically aware, um, like fall into these traps like pretty easily. Can you like point out maybe anything like unconsciously that people might be doing that tie into this idea of like exploiting environments, maybe those that aren't as like blatantly clear, just so people can understand like what sorts of tendencies they're like propagating? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think you can see it um, very easily in the way that we think about agriculture um, and particularly industrial agriculture as the looking at a, a piece of land simply for its capacity to produce a single crop that is useful to people in a you know in a very limited way. So I grew up in Iowa which is a state that now is more or less devoted to corn um, rather than thinking about the landscape in Iowa as being one that can support a whole diversity of, of plant animal and human life. Um, sorry, those are my dogs making crazy noise. <laughs> Let me close my door. Um, so I think that's that's a place where you can see this. I think there's also a tendency because if you've grown up in a capitalist society to think in terms of monetary value for everything that um, thinking about ecosystem services, for example, which is a, a move in some parts of economics to try to think about how you would put value on a wetland and how do you assess it in terms of dollar terms, um, which again is kind of shoehorning it into a very particular kind of construct where the only kind of value that a wetland can give is for human beings rather than seeing wetlands as important because they are you know, vital to human societies all over the world, but they're also vital to bird societies and fish societies. Um, so it's this kind of tendency to reduce things to um, only to human value terms and then only value terms that we can assess with market tools. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And I feel like reduction, especially in like your works, you like tie that idea into like contingency. So um, we talked about like energy scarcity makes ecologically contingency. So um, 
Can you elaborate what that means maybe in the context of like indigenous populations with like the land relations that they have and maybe how like geological contingency like translates into like indigenous like harms that like the state like confers onto them? Yeah, those are two really big questions. So remind me if I don't answer one part. <laughs> um, one of the things that interests me as somebody who spends a lot of time in uh, polar parts of the world, so around the Arctic Circle, um, are the ways in which those environments, if you come from a temperate place or a tropical part of the world, look like they have um, just far less going on, right? European colonizers tend to look at the Arctic and think of it as being barren or kind of lacking something because it doesn't have quite the same kind of plant life um, as is around me here. I'm now in Providence, Rhode Island, or we are in Florida, right, where there are really lush places that have long growing seasons. So up in the Arctic and particularly in the, the far northern parts, um, the ways in which uh, the sunlight gets turned into plant life through photosynthesis, because the growing season is shorter and it's colder, it's covered in snow for a lot of the year, the plant life is just not as tall. Um, it's, you don't have trees, um, you're not gonna have the big fields of corn like I grew up in in Iowa. Um, you have an incredible species diversity um, and it's a very kind of robust ecosystem in that sense and is able to support human lives that are incredibly rich and varied and animal, you know, herds of animals in huge numbers, but it doesn't look quite the same as a temperate climate does. And so there's been a European tendency to kind of judge those Northern places as being lesser uh, for that reason, rather than thinking of them as just having a kind of a different ecological order. But one of the things that that means, particularly for the big animal species like caribou and reindeer that are adapted to living in the far north, um, is that the, the plant life that they depend on um, is never offering them very many more calories than they need just to get by. Um, it's pretty hard work to get fat if you're a caribou, in other words. <laughs> So if it's a tough year for various reasons, um, if migration patterns change so that caribou have to you know, take longer routes to migrate, um, if there's stresses from predators, those sorts of things, it can put way more pressure on them um, just in a kind of caloric sense, right? They get too thin, they're not able to get pregnant. Um, it's much harder to just keep moving because they don't have the energy they need. And then that's somewhat different than spe animal species that live um, in places where there maybe are more plants available for more of the year. So it means that there's this kind of fine line that uh, particularly land animals in the Arctic are always kind of balancing on. And that of course um, has impacts for people too, because in the Arctic people tend to be very um, integrated with and dependent on the animals around them, partly because they're not raising those stands of corn like I grew up with in Iowa. Um, so, you know, if you have a human population that's very dependent on caribou and then the caribou population experiences, you know, some kind of crisis due to environmental changes, then that's really uh, puts pressure on human societies also. Um, and for indigenous folks in the Arctic, historically, the way of dealing with the fact that there's a lot of contingency in those ecologies that they live in is to be able to move between ecological zones based on where there are seasons of plenty um, and where there might be seasons of more crisis, um, which tend to kind of fluctuate in the Arctic like they do in lots of ecosystems. Um, so if it's a really bad caribou year, you might move more toward the coast um, where there are walrus and seals or other kinds of um, nourishment for your families and your community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I first read like that phrase that we were talking about, like ecological contingency, I think like in my mind, at least like subconsciously, I thought might even be like a negative connotation. But in the context of like indigenous relations, like do you think that's almost something like just like a way of life, like moving around because of that contingency and like energy scarcity? Like it's not something that readers should think is like negative, right? No, I don't think it's negative at all. I think it's um, I think it's a, a very um, carefully understood adaptation. Mm -hmm. um, and actually one that societies all over the world historically have adopted, right? Being stuck in one place makes you vulnerable to certain kinds of things that being able to move as a culture allow you to avoid. Um, so severe weather events, right? Hurricanes are really difficult um, on the Eastern seaboard of the United States because the people who live here now 
expect to be able to live in the same place over time, right? We're not adapted to pick up and move um, if the weather becomes really challenging. Um, but historically in the Arctic, the ways of dealing with sort of natural phenomenon is to have some flexibility. And with that flexibility comes an enormous knowledge base, right? You have to be able to live in different kinds of places, know how to read the signs of maybe when you should move because things are looking a little slim where you are now. Um, they're really sophisticated ways of understanding and working with an environment. They just have a sort of a different, um, they're built up from a place that's a little bit different than the kind of settled, particularly urban kind of ways that we live now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I feel, uh, I don't think we've like introduced this, but Dr. Demus does a lot of research in Russia. So just curious, like, so like from someone who like grew up in Iowa, what got you interested in like a lot of like Arctic research? And I like, did you do research when you were like younger too, like moved to the Arctic? I think I read that somewhere. Is that like, yeah, I guess what got you interested to go that far? Um, I, it does go way back. Um, I, when I was finishing high school, I concluded that I, I didn't know what I wanted to study in college. I was kind of looking at, you know, it's a big time commitment. It's like four years of your life. It costs a lot of money. And I didn't feel like I knew what I wanted to do with that time. Um, and so I convinced my parents that I should take a gap year. Um, and at the time, gap years were not all that well kind of institutionalized. I think they've become, there are many more options and it's much more kind of accessible or it's a more known entity in the United States than it was. Um, but I found an organization in Massachusetts that sort of helped people who didn't have much but a high school diploma and like a wild hair to go do something new, find opportunities. Um, and I put together this like really shoestring budget around the world kind of tour that I had planned where I was gonna go to this um, indigenous community in the Yukon called Old Crow. And then I was gonna go to Costa Rica, I think was the next stop. Um, and then I was gonna go somewhere else. Long story short, I've still never been to Costa Rica. Um, I went up to Old Crow. My job there was to train sled dogs. Um, a, something I knew absolutely nothing about when I arrived. Like I had had pet dogs, not the same as I learned very quickly. Um, I had never lived in, I mean, I grew up in Iowa, right? So I had never lived in a place that, that had the same kind of um, environmental circumstances as this village, which is 80 miles north of the Arctic Circle does. Um, and I had never lived in an indigenous community before. So it was a big change on all sorts of fronts. Um, but after I had been there for a couple of months, I was so hooked um, that I ended up staying for a couple of years. Um, and that's really been kind of why, um, or the, the origins for being interested in the Arctic ever since. Is there a reason you picked like that community like in, in the Arctic? Um, I picked it, I was really interested in writing and photography. Um, and it seemed like a place that might be interesting for both. Um, maybe it was a lack of imagination that I felt like my little rural town in Iowa was not providing it. And I really liked, I had always really enjoyed working with animals. So the idea of spending time with a dog team was really appealing. Um, and I'm sure there was like too much reading of Jack London, like some just straight up romantic <laughs> thoughts about what it was to live in the Arctic, which were also very quickly like disabused, the, the kind of mythology of it disappeared and was replaced with something that's a lot richer and a lot more fulfilling. And in Floating Coast, was that from like the experiences you had in that specific area or was it from a different like time or community? So Floating Coast, the, the sort of first draft of that book um, was written as my, um, my PhD dissertation and came from research that I did mostly to the west of where I first lived in the Arctic. So along the coast of Alaska, the Western coast of Alaska, and then the far Northeastern coast of Russia. Um, but my interest in that kind of Bering Strait came from living in Old Crow um, and came from hearing from elders there how you know, the first European trade goods they ever saw actually came from Russia um, because they were moved by kind of these really complicated, intricate, um, networks of exchange all the way from Siberia across the ocean um, and all the way through what's now Alaska and into Canada. Um, so I had always known or had known since I lived in Old Crow that there was this long history of kind of back and forth with Russia. Um, and that's what kind of drew me to thinking about the Bering Strait 
Mm, okay. Yeah, that's definitely something that's very interesting. And um, just going back to like floating coast, there's like this one line that like honestly was super interesting to me. It was like about telling stories. And what you said was it brought the past of these beings into the present, made both the teller and audience a conduit for souls. Um, and as someone who's like, like you're interested and like active in like history and I'm like also interested in it. So I was just wondering as like um, someone who's like, I guess telling narratives almost or of like indigenous communities, how can like um, we like tell those stories almost in like, and be conduit for souls in a way that's like respectful and ethical to like indigenous communities? Yeah, that's a really important question. Dog break again, excuse me. <laughs> Fitting for this conversation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I think that's a really important question and history, um, it comes with a lot of responsibility, I think, to be a historian. And partly that's because you are um, put in the position of narrating people's pasts. And some of those people might be people who look like you or are recognizably similar in some cultural sense. And then some people probably are not. Um, and depending on how far back you go in history, even if you have the same geography and language, it's very possible that the people that you end up writing about seem completely unfamiliar um, because you know, 200 years ago, people had different assumptions about the world. They lived very differently. So anytime you're kind of working with the past and trying to put it in a narrative that makes sense in the present, there's a lot of thought that at least good historians put into how do you do that sort of responsibly and ethically. And then if you're working with communities that have historically been marginalized in very you know clear structural ways the way is true with indigenous folks in north america there's kind of an extra um, necessity for care in that relationship um, and i think you know different scholars have different ways of doing it um, for me one of the most important things is that i don't think of myself as a scholar of anupiaq history or yupik history or chukchi history because there are yupik and anupiaq and chukchi people who are narrating their own histories but what I am is a scholar who wants to think really seriously about what the cultures that I am actually participant in, particularly capitalism, have done in relationship to those communities. So not to ignore them, not to write them out of the history, but understand that they have been in relationship with capitalism or socialism in the case of the Russian side of the Bering Strait. Um, and what, you know, what have these European ideas done in these particular spaces? And then to take really seriously the ways in which uh, Chukchi or Nupiak or Yupik historians narrate their own histories um, and use those and understand those as being arguments about what's true, um, what's right in a kind of a moral sense, what's important in terms of an event, um, and you know, ground those first and foremost or put them at least on par with what the kind of events that a European historian would understand as important. Um, so for example, in this book, it's obviously something that talks about the Russian Revolution because it's talking about the arrival of socialism um, on the Russian side of the Bering Strait. Um, but that's not exactly the event that's the most important orientation point for the book because it's not the event that comes up as being the most critical in indigenous histories of what um, the past 200 years have been like in the Bering Strait. So actually the arrival of whalers in the 19th century is a kind of far more disruptive event in some ways, or needs to be taken as, as disruptive as the kind of imposition of socialism is at first. Um, it obviously kind of takes on a whole set of new attributes as the Soviet Union gains power in the Far East. But um, that was one of the things I really tried to do was make sure that I was thinking about the events that historians from these cultures were representing as being really critical. Um, and I think another way that historians, uh, particularly historians who are trained in Native American and indigenous studies have started to understand these um, kind of issues of how you relate to communities is to kind of work in consultation with the communities as you're developing the histories you're working on. So speak to communities in the present and ask like, what's important? What are the stories that have been left out? What would it be useful for a historian outside your community to communicate to their communities, right? Um, if I have an audience that's, you know, folks that are never gonna go to Alaska, what is it that's helpful for me to communicate? Um, and, and how can I sort of use the skills that I have in terms of languages or research 
uh, for things that are important within your community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. It like the role of like a historian almost like it reminds me of this book. Um, I forgot the talk. I think it was like Mario Villegas. I think he wrote about like a storyteller and how it's like. Um, I think it's like an outsider from like South America goes into like a Peruvian like indigenous community and. Um, so basically, like, I guess, like, just for those who haven't read it, like, the theme of the story is, like, an outsider gets accepted into, like, the circle of the Indigenous community, and a storyteller is, like, someone who not only, like, hosts, like, communal memory, but also, like, re, like, invents history almost, like, for the community and, like, has that important role. So I've, I've been always, like, fascinated by the role of, like, historians as, maybe it's not, like, as much, like, ethical, because that's, like, obviously like more of a fictional novel but like becoming part of like an indigenous community which means that we should foreground like that communication um and just to like quickly go back into um the book again um like the idea of like economic growth um you, like the whaling disruptive event was definitely something that you highlighted in your book um but before we get into like specific events almost but like growth as in like an incantation against mortality or mortality is I think what you said the idea of like economic growth so can you just give some context to like the audience and why um or how I guess you came to that conclusion yeah that's a great question um one of the things that I was really interested with this first book in kind of exploring is not just how capitalism works um in terms of kind of creating commodities out of ecosystems like we talked about earlier but also kind of what it does as an ideology or, or a cosmology, right? As a way of framing what we understand to be normal and particularly our expectations of the future. Um, and I think part of this is if you're trained as a Russian historian, like I was, Russian historians are really used to thinking of socialism, both as a set of economic practices, like how do people arrange their material lives and, you know, get shoes through a factory and out to people who need shoes, like really basic stuff. But it's also kind of this bigger orientation toward the world. Like, what is it to be a good person? What is a good life? Um, what does the future hold for people? So I was interested in sort of comparing the ways that socialism and capitalism dealt with these kind of big metaphysical questions. And one of the things I found really striking actually about both of the ideologies is that they're so focused on the idea that the way to prove that a society is doing well is to show that it's growing in a very material sense. Um, and if you've ever listened to like the um, like the end of day news reports on the radio or kind of what goes on on the ticker on CNN where they're talking about like the stock market growing or shrinking, right? Those become stand-ins for whether or not the economy's healthy, which is a stand-in for like, are we healthy as a society? And growth is sort of a signal of health. And I was really interested by that because it's not the way that all cultures have oriented themselves toward the world, right? There are many ways of imagining that, you know, not growing or growing too much is excessive or immoral. Um, and one of the things that was, was curious is the ways in which both socialism and capitalism are really resistant to thinking about the ways that all biological beings like people have kind of a life cycle, right? We're born, we mature and do work in the world, and then eventually we die. And that there's something about this kind of obsession with growth that's supposed to cover over the death part, right? We're not, we're not going to talk about that. We're not going to talk about the ways in which our economies are dependent on certain kinds of death, right? The death of plants and animals, thinking about using the old death that's in fossil fuels. Um, and instead, we're going to just sort of concentrate on this forward-looking growth obsession. Um, and it, it made me feel almost like the, the entire society is sort of in this adolescent phase where we're like not going to pay attention to any of the, the sort of not bad, the just sort of natural things that happen um, within the course of being a living thing, um, a living being. Um, and that that's something that both capitalism and socialism have in common at a very abstract level, right? They're, they're different in many of their particulars, um, but they're not particularly good at kind of giving people space to think about um, the ways in which they're embedded in these systems that are about both birth and death. Mm -hmm. And like, I know like the term like necrocapitalism is definitely like something that's like talked about with like indigenous communities, but is there, um, is there like, or is there a field in like socialist studies like, or 
for example, like indigenous communities under Russia, like that's like a mainstream way of thinking. Cause I know like a lot of like American studies, like living under a capitalist system, it's like very easy to like say, oh, this is like, like obviously under necro capitalism, but I, I don't know. I, th- I don't think I've ever heard of like a socialist analysis until your book, but how is that like fields going about right now? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's different in, um, it's certainly different in Russian history because the Soviet Union doesn't exist anymore. Um, so the, the whole discipline is kind of looking at a necro in the sense that it's about an experiment that that passed or ended. Um, I think more generally, um, there are big debates amongst contemporary socialists about how to think about the question of growth um, and it, particularly how to think about the question of growth in Marx. And it can get really nerdy really quickly. And people are like really deep into the weeds of reading various parts of Marx. Um, but also, you know, more contemporary theorists who kind of operate in the in the lineage of major socialists like Marx, trying to think about like, does growth have to exist for socialism to work, or is there a degrowth or a kind of more stasis-based version of a socialist economy? Um, and I think it's an open question, or at least that's my sense from the kind of really often pretty tense debates <laughs> that exist. Um, amongst contemporary socialists about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like degrowth, de-development, like that debate <laughs> definitely gets nerdy really quickly. We In like debate, we do a lot of like reading on like different impacts, I guess, like how to like resolve those problems. But yeah, definitely growth. I guess like the idea about like capitalist consumption though, like just turning this back to like the student audience, um, any suggestions that you have for like the students to just like um, safeguard their practices um, and like general tips that you would give them? That's a really good question. Um, and it's one that I struggle with because um, I think I think in the society that I grew up in and am now a part of as an adult, um, there's a real tendency to think about solutions as being individual. Um, so it's like, okay, I need to consume better. Um, I need to think about where my food comes from and I need to use less plastic and I need to, I kind of need to degrowth my life, right? Um, and I, I don't wanna think that, say that that's not important, right? I do think, um, thinking particularly about having a life that's not as fossil fuel dependent is important um, because it lessens the demand for fossil fuels. And you can see that 2020 has actually been um, in a really terrible way, kind of an experiment in what it looks like when there's suddenly less demand for fossil fuels because we're just not traveling as much as a globe um, because of the pandemic. But of course, it would be nice to go about things without a pandemic and with somewhat more order and more equity in terms of how we think about um, some of these questions of of consumption. And I think that's where, for me, particularly if you've grown up in the United States, we need to kind of take this next leap, which is not just about like, am I individually figuring out how to sort of lessen my footprint, um, but am I thinking about ways in which the skills that I have whatever they are, because it's a big problem. So it takes all sorts of skills can contribute to something that's more collective and systemic um, because it's really hard to just opt out, right? Um, if you live in a place where you have to have a car to get your groceries, it's really hard to opt out of having a car. Like you need to feed yourself or if you need a car to have a job. Um, if your job is dependent on fossil fuels in any way, you don't necessarily have the ability to just say, oh, I'm going to get a different job, right? That's that's not how the world works for, for most of us. Um, so thinking about ways in which you as an individual can contribute to something that's more collective and systemic. I also think it's less isolating um, and we've all had way too much isolation this year. So maybe that's made me more, even more prone to think about things that involve kind of thinking at a community level rather than at an individual one. Um, but I would say, you know, we can only be so individually pure if we're living in a kind of late capitalist society that's dependent on fossil fuels. But we can really work collectively to make sure that, you know, in 10 years, we are all less dependent on those things that we find environmentally and socially really harmful. Yeah, and I think now we can transition to more of like the re- more like recent work that you're doing. So um, yeah, can you just give us like a brief overview of like the new field that you're like looking into and um, maybe any research goals that you have and will you see that like going in a couple of years? Yeah, so I'm, um, I'm in the very early days of a book um, that's actually gonna take me back to the part of the Arctic that I first was in when I moved up there at 18. Um, so I'm working on 
a project that looks at the Yukon River watershed. Um, the Yukon River mouth is along the Bering Sea on the Alaska coastline, and then it makes its way all the way up through interior Alaska into uh, the Yukon and then into British Columbia um, in Canada. So it's, it's about 1500 miles long, it's a big river. Um, and part of what interests me along that particular watershed is that it has many different kind of traditions of thinking about the ways in which we should relate to our environment in a kind of political sense. So many different and distinct indigenous traditions of kind of the mediating the human relationship with nature. Um, and then in the eight, late 18th century, the British and Russian empires meet along the Yukon River. And so they bring very different ideas of, you know, whether or not an animal is part of society or whether or not trees count as beings that you consult in your decision-making in some sense, or whether or not the water itself has a particular agency or set of rights. Um, and then of course, now the kind of official political structures are the United States on the Alaskan side and Canada on the Yukon side. Um, so it has all of these different kind of layered traditions, um, some of which of course never went away, right? The indigenous ways of understanding law and practice and relationships with place are still very much there. Um, and so I'm interested in the ways in which those different kind of ideologies have influenced environmental outcomes. Um, so somewhat like the first book thinks about socialism and capitalism, this one is thinking about kind of particular ways in which ideas of rights and um, kind of political agency um, work within different societies and then the, what that hap it turns into or what happens with that um, as those societies kind of change over time. Mm -hmm. And um, when you were explaining like, I guess like the number of like indigenous communities along the tribe, just to clarify, like they're like very distinct like tribes in different areas, right? Is or it's not. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, I mean, it partly because it's a very long watershed. Um, so at the mouth of the Yukon River, there are Yupik communities. Um, and then you get into Dene ten territory or Athabascan in some, um, some scholarship refers to this whole group of um, different language speakers and knowledge bearers up the Yukon, um, but have kind of language ties um, to each other. Um, and then in Yukon, there are Tlingit, uh people who also have a very distinct culture. So there, there are kind of multiple, and of course they've all been, you know, trading with each other and going back and forth for a very long time uh, prior to European colonization. Um, and then the ways in which the British and Russian empires operated kind of existed within that political context. Mm -hmm. And like, um, like your earlier book, you were like, there's like some like very disrupt, like clear disruptive like events that happen. For example, like the whale hunters like arriving in the 19th century. Um, I guess like in this like field of like legality and like water, um, was there like something similar to that? Is that um, like, I guess like a similar focus of the book? It is similar, although I don't quite know what they are yet. Um, it takes, historical research just takes a lot of time. <laughs> and I'm, part of it is that I was supposed to be doing a lot of that research this past year when of course it wasn't safe to travel. Um, so I'm a little bit not quite where I expected to be. Um, my sense is that there are a couple kind of big inflection points, it, particularly if you're thinking about European colonization, um, one of which is the fur trade and the ways in which both the British and Russian empires were in the Yukon because they were interested in animals that had valuable fur. So beavers and marten, um, foxes, animals like that. Um, and then there are a sequence of gold rushes um, much like in Floating Coast, actually, um, that are also extremely disruptive, particularly in Yukon. Um, and I think later on, in the, in, particularly in the early 20th century, the imposition of the, the border between the United States and Canada, um, which sort of officially was there after the United States bought Russia from, or bought Alaska from Russia in um, 1867, but wasn't policed for decades. Um, but once the border becomes something that you needed papers to cross or you needed to check in with a border agent, um, I think particularly for, for communities that are along that stretch of the Yukon, that becomes a really, um, a really important moment of like, you know, where can you hunt? Who can you go visit? Um, you know, where can you move and when? Uh, that had, of course, not been policed by a state before that. Mm -hmm. And when you were like living like near this area, um, did you like experience any, um, I guess like indigenous like 
orientations towards the water? Were there any like practices that you can like recall or um, yeah, like I guess like just gen general attitude towards like indigenous communities, land and water? I think in um, in Old Crow and it's, I mean, it's hard to speak in kind of a, a generalized sense because different indigenous communities have really different articulations of this. Um, but the sense in Old Crow in, in which in country of having um, real responsibility and really belonging to the land and the water um, that kind of form the basis of people's lives. So I was living along the Porcupine River um, and thinking about the Porcupine River both as a, um, it's almost like a practical space, right? It's where you fish, it's where you move up and down in the summer in boats, you move up and down it in the winter with a dog team or with a snowmobile. Um, but it also has this kind of larger significance as, you know, being this kind of critical thing for bringing life to the community through the fish um, and through the animals that cross it, right? So the caribou that are really critical to which in folks cross the Porcupine River. Um, so I think, you know, as, a, as opposed to a model of owning something, um, which is kind of the model that I grew up with, right? Like you have kind of private ownership of land. It's much more a model of collective responsibility and stewardship um, and relationship with a particular place, including the land and the water. Mm -hmm. And um, just like one last question, the idea of like legality is definitely going to be like, you know, something central in your book, as you mentioned. Um, and just from like personal research, I know like in Pennsylvania, there was um, this like movement almost called like Grant, like Grant Township, uh, where like it gave the ability to sue on behalf of nature. Um, just from like, I guess, preliminary research that you've done, like, like, even if like the goal of like such a movement would be like per se to like grant like legal personhood and like give them that right. Do you think that like, um, or like, I guess just how, or what are your views on like that legalizing a recognition? Like how can the act like impede upon like the ambitions that people might've had, which might have been rightful like in their own eyes? This is the question actually that really um, made me interested in this project on the Yukon to begin with is like, is, is the idea of rights as is conceived in Western legal practices one that actually works for thinking about um, giving space in our political and social decision making to an ecosystem or to an animal or to a plant? Um, and honestly, the, the jury is still out. Um, I feel like I'm still kind of acquainting myself with all of the kind of pros and cons. Um, I do think that the the form of rights that exists in US legal systems and in Canada to a similar degree, although it's a little bit different, are very much focused on kind of individual rights um, and particularly what scholars call negative rights. So, you know, the right to not be jailed because of what you say or what we call the right to free speech or the right to not be punished because of your religious background or freedom of religion. Um, as opposed to a set of rights that are about your kind of obligations to a community. Um, and I'm curious, I'm not sure, um, it, perhaps it works to think about the kind of an ecosystem's rights only to be protected from harm, as opposed to thinking about an, an ecosystem as something that we have a back and forth with, right? It's not a position of simply protecting it, it's a position of mutual dependence um, and I don't know if rights is the right framework for that or not. It might be, or it might be as good as we have at the moment. And so, you know, let's just, <laughs> let's give it a try. Um, but it, it's really why I'm kind of interested in this, this question along the Yukon. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. Um, do you have anything to add maybe to like the audience, any um, like maybe experiences or insights that you had when you were like 18 or 17, like our age and something you'd like to share back to us? Um, that's a great question. I think in general, um, I mean, first of all, this is like a, it's a strange year to be in your last couple of years of grad or high school, thinking about college, thinking about kind of the whole trajectory in front of you, because at least my sensation right now is everything feels really contingent and changeable. Um, and one of the things I find comforting as a historian is being able to look back at societies in the past that have also felt this way, right? It's not, we're not the first generation to be like, hmm, seems like some of the kind of basic bedrock things that 
should be working for us or not. And there are ways of actually mitigating and changing that. Societies are not stuck. And that's really hopeful. And I think the other thing kind of as I alluded to before is that the kind of magnitude, particularly of environmental changes that we are uh, facing means that whatever you are drawn to doing and whatever your talents are, working on changing our relationship to how we interact with our environment needs you in some way, right? If that's what you're called to do. It's not like you have to be a climate scientist, although it's great if you are. It's not like you have to be an economist, although it's great if you are, or you have to be an artist, although it's great as you are. Like it, we need all of those skills. Um, and I think that that's something that has really kind of become clear in the last couple of years. And that the people that are trying to think about ways of moving kind of systemically toward a more sustainable and a more just set of relations with, with the people and the places that we live with um, are now really open to that. And I think that's exciting as opposed to like thinking, oh shoot, you know, I'm not an engineer. I'm not sort of good at that or I can do it, but I don't like it. And that's the thing that we all need. We need it all. Um, so it's, it's really kind of wide open. Um, and there's such a kind of groundswell, I think of people now paying attention to these issues um, that you're not going to be doing it alone. Yeah, that's um, really good insight. Thank you so much for joining us today and talking to us about your research. I'm sure that new book, I'm definitely going to read it. It seems really interesting. It'll be a couple years, but. <laughs> research.